Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Good morning. How are you? Y'all glad to be here? Yes. Amen. I want to thank Andrew for being here this morning. Andrew Marshall, who's leading uh, worship this morning. And uh, as we've said every week, we're kind of in this process of learning and uh, bringing up some new people and seeing what God's getting ready to do. And so we're excited about what God's doing and uh, to see different faces up here. And then as we enter into that time of training in July and August and September, a very specific training and honing in, uh, man, I'm excited to see what God's going to do. Now, I've told you the last three weeks, as of four weeks that we've done this, if you have a desire that, or you feel called that you want to be a part of what's going on up here, you need to get with Jeff Masterson. He's the guy that plays the electric guitar. He's one of our elders. He's kind of overseeing this process with us right now. And uh, he can put you on a list, kind of let you know what's going on and what's going to happen and get you involved. Uh, and so if you can play the, uh, the, uh, the saw or the washboard or whatever you play, harmonica, um, you know, we're, we're, we'll, you know, anyway, um, we'll, we'll do it, okay? So uh, just... Uh, Get signed up, all right? Hey, don't forget, next Sunday, what time's church? 10. 10, okay? That's until the end of the summer, all right? So we know you guys are going on vacation and going to be hanging out and all that. And by the way, that means you'll beat the Baptists, the Methodists, the Presbyterian, the Lutherans. You'll beat everybody, the, the non-denom, the, bad, the Bible guys. You'll beat everybody to the restaurants, okay, all during the summer, amen? <laughs> So uh, I'll get you at the same time, about 1120. You can get there before the crowds get there, and, uh, or you can go on to the lake, whatever you want to do. So uh, we want you to enjoy your summer and pack this place out for one service over the summer holidays, and, and then this fall we'll get cranked back up into two services. Well, if you know, we're in our final week of this series called Holy Awakening, and we've been asking the question, what if? What if we took God out of a box? What if we just gave God complete control? And for some of us in the room, that scares us to death. For others of us in the room, we're like, woohoo, you're already there. You're already standing up out of the sunroof in your car, man. Go faster, go faster. You're already there. And then some of you are right in the middle. You don't really know what to think. You think they're crazy. You think they're a stick in the mud. And so you're just kind of here. And a lot of that comes from just what we've talked about over the last few weeks. It's just we don't know or we've seen an abuse or, or, or you know, we, we just we don't know what it means. And so what we've been doing is looking at God's Word and seeing what God word, God's Word says about the Holy Spirit, about the supernatural, the Holy Ghost. What does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? And so if you have your Bibles today, we're going to be in Acts chapter 2. Then we're going to jump over to Galatians and then Ephesians, okay? So that kind of lets you know where we're going and where we're heading. But we're, today I want to go back to Acts chapter 2 because that's kind of the foundation of where we've been working out of over the last three weeks. And by the way, I could literally preach on the Holy Spirit for the next probably five months and still not completely understand everything about the Holy Spirit. In fact, 
I believe that I will go home to be with Jesus one day if he allows me to live another 20 years, 25 years, 30 years uh, that, that I won't even understand or even have a full comprehension of what it means to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's what I love about God. It's deeper and wider than anything I could ever dream or imagine. And so I love that about that. So uh, there's many of you today are going to walk out of here going, man, I, I wish he would take it a little bit longer. We could, we could take everything a little bit longer, right? So we're going to land it right here today. And then this summer, we're going we're gonna to have some fun this summer. So you don't want to miss the summer months. But it all started back in Acts chapter 2 when Jesus uh, went away. You remember Jesus died on the cross. He rose from the grave. He appeared to the disciples. He said, guys, it's best that I go away so that I can send one, the comforter. And so in Acts chapter 2, when, they, uh, when the day of Pentecost came, they, meaning all the disciples, were gathered in one place. And verse 2 said, suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting, and they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came down and rested upon each of them, and all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. Everybody say filled. filled. Yeah, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So let's start with that phrase, filled with the Holy Spirit. You remember, if you go back a couple of weeks, in, in week number one, we looked at John chapter 14, where Jesus said, it's best that I go away. And, and he said, the reason it's best that I go away, because I'm going to send the, the Holy Spirit, which remember we talked about the, that he is our counselor, he is our comforter, he is our God. And so we needed him to be with us while Jesus was here in, in person on earth. You had to be close in proximity to him physically. But he said, look, I'm going to go away. So all of you guys can have the counselor and the comforter and the God that living inside of you. And then remember in week two, we talked about the Holy Spirit being power, that dunamis power that, hey guys, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you're going to have dunamis power. And that's where we get our word dynamite. That's where we get that word that, hey, he's going to blow you up, right? And some of you go, oh, I don't want him to blow me up. Yeah, it's scary, isn't it? It's scary to think there's something living in us that's so powerful, that's so real, and we looked at the power that he's given us that we would share Christ boldly. That when we were weak, that he would, he would strengthen us. But I love what we learned in week two, that, that, the, that there, the Holy Spirit was given to us in power that we may have hope. There's something fundamental in the human nature that hope is what we need, isn't it? You find someone with no hope. It's fundamental to being human. That, that the Holy Spirit has come in us to give us hope in a hopeless world. And also that we would know God in the fullness of who he is. And then last week we looked at the power of the spiritual gifts. The gift of prophecy, the gift of faith, and the gift of healing and serving and giving and leadership and on and on. And, and we looked at the Holy Spirit not only gives us gifts, that, that the Holy Spirit also allows fruit of the Spirit in our life. You remember we said last week that all Christians should exhibit all the fruits of the Spirit, right? But not all Christians will have all the gifts. So that means all of us that call ourselves Christ followers should have the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And so we see in Acts that these believers were filled with the Spirit. That same Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead now came to live in them. As we learned last week, it was the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who gives us gifts. Now, uh, when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we basically, if you take the spiritual gifts, I want to show you this. The spiritual gifts are basically divided up into three categories. And some guys use different words and different uh, parts. But really, here, you see that three categories, there are those speaking gifts. That's what encouragement and prophecy and teaching. And we talked a little bit about those last week. Uh, there's more of those. There's also serving gifts, administration, faith, giving, helps, hospitality, leadership, mercy, pastoring. And then there's the sign gifts. And, and this is where everybody gets kind of, um, what's the right word? <laughs> Uptight, mad, defensive. Okay, anyway, um, here we have discernment and knowledge and wisdom and miracles and healings and tongues and interpretation of tongues. Here, there's a whole lot of controversy around that. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. But today I want to look at what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2 verse 4, and they spoke in other tongues as a spirit enabled them that when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they went out and they spoke in tongues. And at the moment, at that moment, that's when things kind of got goofy, controversial, right? Maybe a little bit weird, tricky. 
Because see, actually what it means here in Acts chapter 2 is they were speaking in other human languages. That they were speaking in other human languages. Now, before you race to, to run ahead of me, hang on, okay? We'll get to where you are, some of you, right now. Okay? I, I can see some of you. You're already there. But in this particular passage, they were speaking in other human languages. In fact, there was all these Jews. They were gathered there. They, it, it was, it, it, they were all in that place. And when the, and the disciples came out and they started speaking, all of these God-fearing Jews were like, hang on a second. They were from all over. They spoke all these different languages. And here these guys came out, the disciples who had been filled with the Holy Spirit, those tongues of fire that came and rested on them. They go out and they start preaching. And all these people are like going, hey, hey whoa, whoa, whoa. You're a dumb fisherman, and I can understand you. And, and you, you're a tack. And, and literally, they were so astonished at what was going on. The only way they knew how to explain it was, <laughs> I know what's going on here. These guys are drunk. I mean, pretty good conclusion, right? They had just lost their sa Savior. They had just lost someone they followed. So why wouldn't they be drinking, Right? I know some of you are too religious to laugh at that. <laughs> they were confused that these guys must be drunk, wasted, toasted, buzzed. These guys have got to be drunk. Everybody say drunk. drunk. Say, oh, come on now. Some of you are too religious. Let's try that one more time. Everybody say drunk. Because we're going to see in just a minute, there's a comparison. It's basically, Peter had to come out and say, guys, listen, they're not drunk. They're just filled with the Holy Spirit. And by the way, it's 9 o'clock in the morning. I know for some people that doesn't matter, right? You have a friend. You don't know about that experience, right? Okay. And Peter says, look, it's 9 o'clock in the morning. Guys, these guys aren't drunk. These guys are filled with the Spirit. Something's happened. Something's come on us. They has empowered us. And that's why we're doing this. And they're speaking in tongues. And this became very, very confusing and controversial. And yet here we are 2,000 years later. And guess what? It's still controversial. We're still having these issues and those pendulum swing, depending on what, how you grew up. And some of you grew up in, in what it means to be spirit-filled and you grew up in a church that said, oh man, you gotta be, oh, you're saved? Have you been baptized with the Holy Spirit with evidence of tongues? See, some of us grew up that way. And the moment you start hearing that, you feel like a second-class citizen, right? Well, I, I haven't spoken in tongues, but I, I know the Spirit lives in me. And, and we had those pendulum swings where some of us grew up and, and you heard tongues for the very first time and it scared you to death, amen? Or you saw something miraculous and it swings way over here to where all this has got to be evident here and then it swings all the way to the other side that those sign gifts no longer exist. Those sign gifts don't exist over here. Now, they may exist over there, but we're so self-centered in our Western culture and Western Christianity that we can say it doesn't exist here, but yet it will exist over there. Ouch, I know. And see, for some of us in this room, that's what we think. I mean, how many of you, I've asked you this every week, and I know some of you are here, and you haven't been here in a couple weeks, but how many of you guys have been around a church where people have spoken in tongues. Raise your hand. How many of you guys, come on, be honest. Yeah? Oh, that's a bunch of us. Okay. How many of you say you've been around it, but you always kind of thought it was a little bit weird? Yeah, amen. Now, how many of you are not raising your hand because you're waiting to see what I'm going to say? <laughs> Anybody? Come on, be honest. Yeah, okay, y'all got to speak in tongues for the next 30 minutes, okay? That's the deal. All right, I'm, I'm just kidding, not really. But um, see, well, here's what I want to do. This is such a controversial issue. I want us to take a few moments and see what the Bible says about speaking in tongues. And then we're going to talk about what it means to be filled with the Spirit. Because this speaking in tongues thing, I was, I was reading R.T. Kendall, who pastored um, the uh, Westminster Chapel over in England for almost 25 years. And he says that the gift of tongues is probably the most offensive because it attacks at the very core of your pride. That you've got to let go and let something else take over. And so what happens is we push back on that. And so I want to take and give you two big thoughts when it comes to uh, tongues, and then I want to talk about what it means to be filled with the Spirit. Number one, two big thoughts if you're taking notes. We learn very directly from Scripture that when someone speaks in tongues publicly, like as in church, that it teaches, the Bible teaches there must be an interpretation. There must be an interpretation. 
If the Holy Spirit moves on someone to speak in an unknown language or a prayer language, they're, they're called different things. There's an unknown language. There's a prayer language in the Scriptures. We see that. But if there's ever a public speaking in that, the Scripture says there must be an interpretation. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14. He says this. Paul's writing the Corinth church. He's making some corrections in the Corinth church. That's all the whole letters of Corinthians is about is correcting different practices that were going on in the church. And so when it comes to gifts, it was very controversial. They were arguing about gifts. So Paul was making some corrections about the gifts. Remember, we looked at 1 Corinthians 12 where he listed out the gifts. And then in 14, he's actually talking about how to use the gifts. In verse 4, chapter 14, verses 27 and 28, he says, If anyone speaks in a tongue, two or at the most three should speak one at a time. And someone must interpret. If there's no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in church and speak to himself and God. In other words, if God's giving you this gift and it appears that if you are in church that you can pray quietly in the gifts, you can pray quietly in a tongue and that, but if God gives you a public word, there must be an interpretation. There's got to be an interpretation. The problem is in churches, I've been in church, I remember the first time I went to the first real Pentecostal church. And what I mean by Pentecostal church is, is that they get saved every week. There's no security of the, of the believer. And so if they don't pray to receive Jesus right before they die, they're going to go to hell. And they speak in tongues. And it's crazy, man. And I, I'm telling you, the first time I went, I was like, I mean, my eyes were as big as saucers, man. I'd never been a part of anything like that. But literally, they, they would get to a point in the service and and you, maybe you've been to one service like this and they would literally say, let's all prophesy in the spirit and everybody would start speaking in tongues. And I was sitting there, I'm a believer. I'm going, dude, this is whacked. <laughs> Amen? You ever been in a situation like that? It's exactly what Paul's correcting. It's exactly what he's saying. The Bible says only two or three must and should speak, at most should speak. Nobody else should do this. And there should be an interpretation. Look at verse 23. So if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in a tongue, like I was talking about, and some who do not understand or some unbelievers come in, will they not say that you are out of your mind? <laughs> if everybody does it, people are going to be going, I'm out of here, right? See, I grew up in a very conservative church. We were never around tongues. And I got to be honest with you, the first time that happened and it all broke loose, I was like, dude, this is of the devil. That's my first thought. I don't say uncomfortable laugh. Thank you, Rhonda. Like, everybody else like, I ain't laughing at that. But I mean, I didn't understand. Can you imagine if an unbeliever comes in who's never been to church or had a bad experience in church and they come in and everybody starts going crazy and doing the soul train around the church, Amen. He's like, baby, we got to go right now. Amen? So the first thing Paul says, if tongues are publicly, there's got to be interpretation. Here's the second big thought. The Bible teaches that speaking in tongues strengthens, strengthens the person speaking, not the entire church. Look at verses 4 and 5. A person speaking in tongues is strengthened personally, but one who speaks a word of prophecy strengthens the entire church. And look what Paul says. I wish you could all speak in tongues. But even more, I wish you all would prophesy. For prophecy is greater than speaking in tongues unless someone interprets what you're saying so that the whole church will be strengthened. Very, very clear. It's interesting to me that Paul was talking to the Corinthians. There was a lot of fighting going on, as I said. A lot of try, trying, trying to figure out. And yet, even today, in some circles, there's still that same thing going on. And we know there's gifts and we see what Paul says, and we're kind of arguing, and we're pitting each other against each other and going, well, they're charismatic, and they're conservatives, and they're fundamentals, and they're whatever. And we have all these labels. I find it interesting, as Paul was talking about spiritual gifts, he couched the spiritual gifts in chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians and chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians, and he drops in this chapter right in the middle. Y'all know what that chapter is in 1 Corinthians 13? How many of you guys had that read at your wedding? Amen? Anybody had that read, read at their wedding or their kid's wedding? Yeah? You know it has nothing to do with weddings? It has everything to do with how we administer the gifts. Now, think about this. I mean, right in the context, right in the middle of him doing this in 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3, look what he says. He says, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels and I don't have love, I'm a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Ouch. 
if I have the gift of prophecy and, and, can, and, and, and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have a faith that can move mountains, but I don't have love, I have what? Nothing. And if I give all my possessions to the poor and give over my body the hardship that I may boast, who's that about? But don't have love, I gain what? Isn't that amazing? Right in the middle of the gifts, Paul goes, stop. I mean, there's almost this tension going on here. As Paul is writing to the Corinth church, and I think we could hear it today as well, there's almost this tension that he's going, enough, stop this. Stop arguing about this. Don't make me say this again, almost. Verse 18 of chapter 14, he says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. And he's saying it's a gift. He's not discounting tongues. In verse 19, but in the church, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. I'd rather do five words than 10,000 words in tongues. I wonder what those five words would be. How about this? Jesus loves you a lot. Wouldn't that be good? What if you just went around speaking that? Jesus loves you a lot. Lot, 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 lot. I know that's more than five. What if? And here's what Paul's saying. It's better than 10,000 words in a tongue that people don't understand when it comes to the church. And so some of you are sitting here right here going, well, Edward, do you believe in tongues? Absolutely, unequivocally, yes. Then why don't we summit, summit, right? That's what some of you are sitting here thinking. Some of you are like, glad we don't. Well, you're missing it. You see, the answer is simply this. If everybody did it, they'd think we were crazy. Listen, they already think we're crazy enough in this community. Can I get an amen? amen? I know. But this gift, quite honestly, speaking five intelligible, intelligible words is better than people speaking in tongues without an interpretation. So we've always taken the position at Summit Heights for public worship at Summit Heights Fellowship. We simply ask if non-Christians or non-believers are here, and you have the gift of tongues, we just ask you not to do that publicly here because our whole goal, our whole mandate is the church, is the mandate that people would know the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we don't want anything standing in the way of that. You see, we've somewhere flipped the switch to say that our whole mandate in the gospel is that we may collect gifts and brag to others about our gifts and, and put others down that don't have those gifts. We've somewhere flipped the switch to think it's all about us when God has given us gifts so that the gospel may go forward and so that people may know Jesus. Not that so we can grandstand in church, not that speaking in tongues in church is a grandstanding, but the whole mandate of the church is that people may know the gospel. And the reason I bring this up is because there's so much confusion around this one particular gift. I think if Jesus would have left that one gift out, everybody would be fine with the gifts. Isn't that, don't you think so? <laughs> so I think the pressing question is this. Do you have to speak in tongues to be filled with the Spirit? are speaking in tongues the only evidence of a spirit-filled life. And there are some churches that teach that. I've got a good friend of mine. And every time we're on the phone, Ed, have you been filled with the spirit yet, bro? Have you spoken tongues? Nope. That's my answer. I sure haven't, but I sure have the filling of the spirit. I've interpreted tongues. God has allowed me to do that. But I've never spoken in tongues. See, I, I'm going to say this. And I think I'll argue this until the day I die, that the best evidence of the Spirit-filled life is a believer who exhibits the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. I mean, can you imagine if someone interacts with you at work, at Brookshire's, Red Rooster, Subway, and they walk away from you going, dude, that is the most loving, kind guy I've ever seen. That dude, nothing stirs her. They're so patient. They're gentle. They're faithful. They're self-controlled. 
Man, I don't know what you have, but I want it. Wouldn't that be good? Isn't that the greatest evidence of a spirit-filled life? Is that the fruit of the Spirit's falling off? I still remember driving down the five, the uh, Highway 5 in California. And, and we were going out to the, to the middle of the state, heading up towards Bakerfield. And we kept seeing these big trucks. And all of a sudden, there would be this sloshing. And a whole bunch of tomatoes would come out of the back of the truck, fall all over the ground. I mean, everywhere. And so we started looking for these trucks and, and we'd see tomatoes on the side of the road and, and at first we didn't know what they were and then we'd see these trucks and, these, and start sloshing around. I don't know what the guy was doing, but tomatoes would go out everywhere. And we started laughing. I was like, dude, this is awesome. And God said, that's what it looks, should look like. Fruit should be falling off of you, Edward. As you're moving, as you're doing life, you ought to be sloshing out that fruit of the Spirit that people would walk away and go, I want some of that. I want a little bit of that. See, what they're seeing is the evidence of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And you're not going to have all the gifts of the Spirit, but we should have all the fruit of the Spirit in our life. So, so let me transition because here's what I want to do for the rest of our time because still I want to clear up some stuff. And very specifically, how do we live the spirit-filled life? What does it look like? And what does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? So we're going to be in Galatians chapter 5, and then we're going to end in Ephesians chapter 5. So if you want to get ready to go there, get your sword drill ready. For some of you that grew up with sword drill, amen. And so you're ready for that. Get them on your apps. You're ready for this. Galatians 5, 16 and 17. Here's what Paul says. As Paul says, so I say live by the Spirit. Everybody say live by the Spirit. Live by the Spirit or be filled with the Spirit or walk by the Spirit or keep in step with the Spirit, be led by the Spirit. You kind of get it? He said, so I say live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. In other words, you won't be continually, continuing to live in sin if you live by the Spirit. It doesn't say you won't sin. It says you won't continue to live in sin, okay? Look at verse 17. For the sinful nature, our flesh, our body, the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want to do. Now, so here's the deal. There's some of you who are believers in here and you're spiritually born again. You trusted Jesus Christ. Here's what you need to understand is that the Holy Spirit became a resident of your life. The scripture teaches that the Holy Spirit now lives in us if we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. He, he came into your life. You may not have felt it. You may not have had any, any, any kind of warm, fuzzy feelings or anything like that. But we know scripture says that he now lives in us and seals us. And some of you are going, well, if the Holy Spirit lived moving into my life, then, then why do you seem a lot closer to God than me? Why does she seem closer to God than me? You ever ask that question? Or how about they seem to walk in so much more power. They seem to have so much more faith. They overcome sin so much easier. And when they pray, dude, it's like heaven comes down. Why do I struggle so much? And the reality is, as we've said over the last couple of weeks, is that they may be simply yielded to the Holy Spirit more than you are. In other words, they've learned how to yield to the Holy Spirit. Or, or can I just be honest? Maybe they're in a good season. You ever been in a good season? And that good season all of a sudden comes to an end and you're like, God, where'd you go? God, what's going on? See, we don't talk about that very often, do we? Because we have this whole picture that, hey, once I'm filled with the Spirit, everything's going to be great from now on. Right. Go read the Old Testament. Go read the psalmist. Go look at what was happening where those guys felt abandoned. See, maybe they're in a good season because what's happening is our fleshly nature, my selfish desires, they, they war against the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit's wanting me to do the right thing and my body says, I don't want to do that. You ever been there? Well, I don't want to. That's your flesh rising up. And the Holy Spirit in you is going, no. It's like when my son is about to do something and I look at my son, no, he's, No, no, right? There's a war going on. So if you've ever seen someone that seems like they have more power, it simply could be they're in a good season or they're more yielded. 
And yet, here's what I would say to you. The same spirit that is in them is in us and is available to us. The same spirit that rose Christ from the dead is now available to us if we'll yield ourselves to it. In Ephesians chapter five, one of my favorite passages for so many reasons, it's part of my mission statement that I wrote when I was in college. And Paul goes on to write in Ephesians five, verses 15 and 18. He said this, so be very careful how you live. Don't live like fools. In other words, don't be an idiot. Amen? Look at your neighbor and say, don't be an idiot. (laughs) Scriptural, don't get mad at them. Some of you really meant that too. He says, be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity, he says, in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. And here's how you do it, verse 18. He says, don't be drunk with wine, because you'll ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Everybody say, be filled. filled. Don't be drunk, be filled. Let me say it again, don't be drunk. Be filled. He says, don't be drunk on wine, which will ruin your life, and instead be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, it's interesting. If you go back to that opening verse in Acts, what do they accuse the disciples of being? Drunk, right? All the Jews thought they were drunk. And Paul here is making a comparison in in the book of Ephesians. He's saying, guys, listen, don't be drunk. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, when someone is drunk, what do we say? They are under the what? Under the influence, right? Right? So when someone is drunk, they're under the influence of alcohol. That means that something else is controlling them. That means they're under the power of or influence of, they're being controlled by alcohol, right? When they're drunk. And let me stop right here. We'll talk about this more this summer. So come on back. Some of you right now, because your position is so legalistic, because you grew up like I did, is that one drink means you're drunk. There's nothing wrong with having a good glass of wine if you can handle it with a good steak, amen? And there's nothing wrong with having a good beer at night. The problem is some of you can't have just one. That's where the problem comes in. That's why he says, don't get drunk. That's why he says, when you get drunk, you think differently, you act differently, you talk differently. Some of you have different voices when you're drunk. Some of you say stuff that you would never say sober. Why? Because you're under the influence. And that's why Paul says, don't get drunk with wine. And listen, I know some of you can't go near wine. That's why we do recovery ministry. Others of you have, you can have a glass of wine. You can have a beer. And there's freedom in the spirit. And some of you need to stay completely away from it. And others of you can enjoy it. But here's Paul's making this comparison. Don't get drunk because when you're drunk, you have different thoughts. You speak different words. You have different behaviors. So he says, don't be under the influence of alcohol, but be filled with the Spirit. And you could say being under the influence or being drunk with the Holy Spirit, amen? We could use that same comparison that when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we are under the influence of the Holy Spirit. So you will think differently, right? So you will talk differently. And you will act differently when you are filled under the influence of the Holy Spirit. So Paul says, live by the Spirit, walk by the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit, don't be drunk, be filled. Why do people get drunk? This is interesting. You ever ask that question? Why do people get drunk? I think mainly for two reasons, and there is an ultimate reason, I'll tell you. But I think for two reasons. One is because they're hurting and they want comfort. And alcohol, they believe, will change the way they feel. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. And other people drink to give them confidence. We've seen it in movies. Maybe you've seen it for real. Guy, give me a drink. I'm fixing to go do this. Right? They'll slam a whiskey and they'll run out the door looking for confidence. Isn't it interesting how a substance in this world is an incredibly bad counterfeit of what the Holy Spirit wants to do in our life? Before some of you judge people who struggle with alcohol, you're shopping therapy because you're hurting is also a pretty poor counterfeit. Amen? You're stress eating. You may not struggle with alcohol, 
But you may struggle when you need comfort just to eat. And so before you judge someone with alcohol, because listen, I grew up in a church that wouldn't even allow a man to serve as a deacon if he worked for Stroh's Brewery. Even though he didn't drink, his money came from an alcohol. So I get it. It's easy to judge this one sin. But your sin of overeating and your sin of going and doing shopping therapy because you're lonely and you run up debt, it's interesting. Yet when we're hurting, instead of being drunk, that Jesus gave us the comforter, the paraclete, the Holy Spirit. And Paul says, don't be drunk on wine. Be filled with the Spirit of God who can comfort you in your hardships, whose presence can actually give you peace. That goes beyond any human ability to even comprehend or understand that when we are filled and leaning into the Holy Spirit, that he will comfort us. And there will be a peace that passes all understanding. And I've been there when my life was out of control and I was running down the road and running away where the Holy Spirit just kind of came in and landed and changed everything. Where a drink would have been really good. I've often said that if I had a drink 25 years ago, I would be a drunk today. Instead, God showed me the Holy Spirit that he gave me the Holy Spirit to give me peace and give me comfort. And this is big because when you experience the presence of the Spirit, just like a drunk who will do anything for another drink, when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you'll do anything to get more of the Spirit. (laughs) You'll do anything to be in his presence. You'll do anything to be filled with his power, to be transformed by his goodness to understand his comfort and his guiding and his power and and his hope in a hopeless world. Listen, when you get some of that, you'll do anything to get more. You'll do anything to get more. And I'm telling you, when you begin to yield to the Holy Spirit, the the gifts and the fruits that will move in and through you will astound you as you live just a naturally supernatural life. Did you hear that? A naturally supernatural life. And in the church world, I hate this. There's so much debate about this. Well, is it at the moment of salvation you experience the Holy Spirit? Or is there a second blessing? You get around long enough, you're going to hear that. Well, you need a second baptism. Oh, now listen, son, have you, have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? Maybe I'm just too simple. Maybe I'm just tired of fighting. Maybe I'm tired of arguing. But to me, it's always been pretty silly what we fight about. Because, you see, I believe if there's one, there's two. If there's two, I promise you there's three. And if there's three, there's 19. And if there's 19, there's 93 billion fillings of the Holy Spirit. And the reason I believe that is because the most literal translation to be filled with the Spirit is in the present tense verb of the Greek that literally means to continue to be filled. So is it two? That's all you want. Is that all you want? Or is it three? Or is it four? It's a continue to be filled. And to be filled this afternoon. And to be filled in the morning. And to be filled tomorrow at lunch. And to be filled tomorrow night. To be filled on Tuesday. To be filled. It's continued. And somewhere the enemy has nailed us down that no, it's only two. It's a continuing of. That we are continued to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. To be filled, to be baptized. Do you only take two baths in your whole life? Think about it. My kids get in the swimming pool and they baptize each other over and over and over. And in the summer, that is their bath. Amen? (laughs) Don't look at me judgmental. Our question in the summer is, did they swim in chlorine? They're clean. Amen? Yeah, that's summertime at my house. See, it's a continual ongoing work of the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit to sanctify us, to make us look more like Christ. That's the purpose of the Holy Spirit, to sanctify us and to make us look more like Jesus Christ. And here's the bonus. He gives us gifts. I used to love it when my daddy would travel 
And he would go to those tool shows in Chicago and he'd, he'd go to those tool shows in Atlanta. And that was back in the day where they got free stuff at every booth. Y'all remember that? And dad would get two sacks, one for John, one for me. And John and I would be at the door, that's my brother, and, and we'd be waiting on dad to come in. And we couldn't wait for dad to come in because he would hand us our sacks and we would dump them out on the floor and we would just play for hours because daddy brought gifts. But guess what? If daddy hadn't have brought a gift, he's still my daddy. Amen. Come on. Amen. He's still my daddy. And he loves me completely. By the way, there's more spiritual gifts available to you. I'm discovering even now, as I've been walking with God for so long, I'm even, I told you, I was, I'm discovering, wow, I do have that gift. I'm finding out that even God's given me a little bit of gift of mercy. I don't want that. It helps when you're a pastor. <laughs> I think there's more. I think there's more. And can I just say this? Some of you need to take another drink. Some of you have been Baptist and Presbyterian and Methodist so long. Some of you have been conservative so long. You need to take another drink. Now, listen, I'm not telling you to go drink alcohol, okay? Some of you are like, see, baby, I told you. That's why I like this church. I, I'm not saying that. <laughs> that's all some of you want to hear today. You know? well, we're going to Red Rooster right now. You need to get drunk on the spirit, man. Honestly, you need to take another drink. See, some of you have incredible gifts. The problem is you're functioning in the gift without the fruit of the spirit, and you're meaner than a snake. Yeah. Some of you are good at what you do, but you're just a jerk. Some of you are incredible. You're making an impact all over this place. But when you interact with each other, you're rude and condescending. And some of you need to take a drink, man. Just like in the real world, somebody goes, dude, you need a drink. In the spirit world, some of you need a drink. His name is the Holy Spirit. How do you do it? Open up the word of God. I'm going to say that again. I know some of you don't believe the scripture. I'm not asking you to. I'm talking to believers this morning. If you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you need to know the word of God. Let the word of God get in you, and I'm telling you, it'll come out of you. The problem is some of you aren't getting anything in you. You just mean and honorary. Open his word, man. Why don't you turn on a little worship music? You know, I love classic rock and roll and old school country like any other guy. I'm telling you. I was singing this this morning or looking at this this morning. And I had that old country song, Hank Williams Jr., Hank, why do you drink to get drunk? You know, and I, I was sitting there singing that all morning. I know that's not spiritual, but that's what was going through my mind. I mean, 4 o'clock this morning, I'm in there singing, like, tell me, Hank, why do you drink to get drunk? Anyway, um, Sometimes you need to turn that off. Can I just say that? And you need to put some Jesus music. That's what my daughter told me the other day. We were driving down the road, and she hooked her um, phone up to our car. She goes, Daddy, I don't have that song. I, I need just Jesus music right now. You know what? Some of you just need some Jesus music. I'm telling you. Because what you're filling your head with doesn't make you aware of his presence. It makes him run away. Some of you need to change that. I'm not telling you to go home, burn all your rock and roll and country CDs. Give them to me. <laughs> I'll take care of them. We'll pray over them. Amen. I'm just telling you, sometimes you need to turn that crap off and put some Jesus stuff in you. Because if you're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you need to know the Word of God and get the Word of God in you. Be aware of His presence. Look for Him. Serve someone. Use your gifts. Listen, there are so many ways to experience the, the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, and yet the enemy has narrowed it down to you got to speak in tongues, or we've even confused that freedom and worship is what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and yet neither one of them show evidence of anything sometimes. Some of you have said, well, to be spirit-filled, i got to be able to raise my hands and say, no, you're talking about worship. We're not talking about the power and the filling of the Holy Spirit. Some of the most powerful moments I've ever been in had nothing to do with music or noise or movement or anything. 
And what we want to do is pit everything against each other when it's the Spirit and the Word. The Word and the truth, the Spirit and the truth. You can't divorce them from each other. He is the gift giver. There's some of you in here today, some reason you know, because the Holy Spirit's brought you here so you can be filled. You can take another drink and you can go out of here today and keep drinking. Keep being filled with the Holy Spirit. And yet some of you came in here spiritless, dry, and the Holy Spirit is drawing you this morning. He wants to comfort you, guide you, convict you, empower you to live through you, give you gifts to serve so that those out there will know the Jesus we proclaim to know in here. And the Spirit wants to fill you and change you. So don't be drunk with wine. Be under the influence of of the Holy Spirit. And may you be like that tomato truck in California that right in the middle of your service, right in the middle of your family, that you are so filled with the Spirit that the fruits of the Spirit just pop out. And your family and your teams and your employers and your employees begin to go, I don't know what you have, but I want it. I don't know what you have, but I want it. And may everywhere you go be a trail of just spiritual fruit, like that highway. (laughs) I wish I had taken pictures. I didn't think about it. I wish you could see it. Some of you have been out there and know what I'm talking about. But sometimes I just think that that ought to be our wake we leave, not the wake of vengeance and anger and impatience but the wake of the fruit of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness. And people start following you around going, I want some of that. Because see, the Holy Spirit gives hope in a hopeless world. And there's something fundamental about the human condition that we need hope. And God has filled us with the hope that they need. Amen? Let me pray for you. Well, Father, we ask in this moment, in this presence, that your Holy Spirit would do a supernatural work in our lives. God, everyone who's a believer, everyone this morning that knows you and has a relationship with you, that God, in the name of Jesus, you'd fill them. You'd fill them with your Holy Spirit, with the presence and that reality. With every head bowed and every eye closed this morning, as we close out this series and we move into the summer, As you're praying this morning, I wonder, for some of you guys, for many years, you would say you've heard about the Spirit, you know about the Spirit, but you're not living by the Spirit. But you're not living by the Spirit. You're not walking by the Spirit. You're not empowered by the Holy Spirit. You're not even experiencing an ongoing presence. And I know some of you, you've been through some crazy times this year. And right now, it seems like God's far, far away. Then I want to invite you right now. You see, I believe that when we begin to pursue him, that he will fill us. That we can be more aware of him and the direction in our life, of his guidance in our journey. And if that's you today and you would say, Edward, I want more. I want more. I need more this morning. Would you just be honest this morning, no one looking around, and just slip your hand up and say, I want more. I need more. Yeah. Amen. Thank you for your honesty. But you just say, I want more. That's me. I want to be under the power of the Holy Spirit. Anybody else? Just be honest. Yeah. Hands all over this place. Father, thank you for everyone in this room who's hungry for more. And God, I pray this morning that as they talk this over this afternoon, as they maybe meet in their small groups, or God, even as they just move out of this place today, that they would become aware of you, that your Holy Spirit would fill them, baptize them, overcome them right where they sat this morning, that they would know your presence. God, would you convict us of our sin? May we come and give 
and to the reality of the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome sin. Some of us in this room, the reason we're not filled with the Holy Spirit, Father, is because there's sin in our life. So God, I pray for those that are here this morning that want to know more of you. Would you convict of sin? Would you give comfort to those that need comfort? God, I pray that there'd be some in this building, in this service and the next, that they would be so burdened by the spiritual gifts that you've given them that they would begin to serve here and out there. And God, whether we speak in tongues or we don't speak in tongues, that God, we would be filled with your Holy Spirit doing what you want us to do. Not gratifying our sinful nature, but doing what you've called us to do. Living under the influence of the Holy Spirit. So God, give us courage. And God, I ask right now that you, the Holy Spirit of God, Holy Spirit, would you draw people to you? With every head bowed and every eye closed, we're going to land this this way this morning. In just a moment, we're going to take communion. And some of you are going to go as families and small groups to take communion. But here's what I want to invite you to do this morning. Our elders and some of our prayer team are going to be across the front this morning. And I want to invite you this morning, as you pray right now, there's some of you, the reason you don't have power is because you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. There's never come a point in your life where you've confessed your sins and invited him to be the Lord of your life. And so therefore, you don't have his presence. You're not in a relationship with him. And so I want to invite you. There's some of you being drawn by God. You don't understand it. There's something in your heart right now. You're going, I want some of that. Maybe you grew up in church and maybe you made a decision on years and years and years ago, but you've walked away from that and you know it wasn't real. You know you haven't lived it and God's tugging on your heart right now. And I want to invite you. That's the Holy Spirit drawing you, by the way. He's drawing you right now. And so I want to invite you, if you're under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, you feel guilty, you feel unworthy, <laughs> that's the Holy Spirit showing you you need a Savior, by the way. You need a Savior for forgiveness because He loves you. And He loves you a lot. There's the five words. He loves you a lot. In fact, he loved you so much, he died on the cross for your sake and my sake so that you and I may be in a relationship with him. The scripture says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And right now, some of you are being drawn. And so I would invite you right now, right where you sit, just to pray this simple prayer. If you have never surrendered your life to Christ, I don't care how long you've been in church, I don't care what other people are gonna think at this moment, I'm asking you if you'd be willing to pray this prayer. Heavenly Father, just pray it with me. Heavenly Father, save me from my sins. Change me like Jesus. I believe that Jesus died for me and he rose again so I could live for you. Fill me with the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead so I can serve you and live for you in every way. Thank you for new life. In Jesus' name, if you prayed that prayer, I'm going to ask you to do something very bold. Would you just slip your hand up? If you prayed that prayer with me this morning, slip your hand up. Anybody? Okay. I see your hand on front here. Anybody else? You just slip your hand up. Say, I prayed that prayer. Anybody else be bold enough? Going once. Going twice. I see your hand. Amen. Amen. All right. Going once. Anybody else? I don't, want, I, I don't want to quit. I want more, amen. Going twice. All right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to take communion. We're going to worship. And listen, if you raise your hand, I'm going to ask you to do something very bold. Let's stand together, amen. Can we stand? We're almost done. We're going to take communion. We're going to sing a song. After you take communion, come back to your chairs. We'll close out. But if you prayed that prayer and raised your hands, I'm going to ask our prayer team and some of their uh, spouses and wives to come and uh, be across this front. And if you prayed that prayer, I'm going to ask you to do something very, very bold, okay? Incredibly bold. I'm going to ask you to step out. Everybody's going to be moving because there's going to be some going to take communion. There's going to be some coming to pray. And, and, and maybe you would just step out and come and grab one of these couples or one of these individuals by the hand and say, I prayed that prayer. 
I prayed that prayer. And let them bless you and let them pray over you, okay? So let's do that this morning. Let's respond with communion. For all believers that have made a decision for Christ, you can take communion and pray together. But listen, if you prayed that prayer, I want you to come and grab one of these by the hand. Say, I prayed that prayer this morning. Maybe you need prayer this morning and you would come to them and let them pray over you and encourage them. Let's respond, amen? Come on, let's go. Let's, let's move. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ. Or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day. And listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.